<laughs> compared to these guys. They're, the weeds that we deal with in our yards are so tame compared to what we're going to talk about tonight. So um, we're going to start out by talking about weeds that are probably more common than familiar to you. There are a few things that I see on the list you guys put in that we didn't include tonight, but we can talk about them as well. Um, and then it'll move into some of the more uh, really um, maybe even potentially dangerous noxious weeds that we want you to be aware of. Um, and, and be sure they're not in your yard, but also be aware of them in the environment around you. Uh, some of those are good ones to report uh, to the King County Noxious Weed Program folks. So let's see what we got here. So with that, I wanted to start by talking about regular weeds. So these are weeds that we often see in our own yards that we often complain about, much easier to manage. Um, also have useful properties. Some weeds that grow in our gardens actually have potential for um, telling you what kind of soil you have, what kind of environment they're living in because they prefer certain soil uh, types or uh, moist soils or they like a lot of sun or they like poor nutrition in the soil. And so that can actually give you clues as to how you're managing your garden. Noxious weeds can do the same thing, but just on a much bigger level. Um, and then weeds can also be some of them useful. So plantain that you see on the right is actually a weed you can use to make salves out of. I do it all the time. I have it in my yard. I let it grow a while and then harvest it out as I weed it. And then clover fixes nitrogen in uh, people's lawns, but it also um, can feed bees. So the flowers are really good bee food. And the dead nettle is actually an edible plant. It's not terribly tasty, but it tells you a lot about uh, that your ground is disturbed um, and maybe uh, that needs to be settled and you need to build up um, soil um, microorganism uh, colonies to keep your soil more intact. Um, so lots of good information can come out of weeds, but then when we're talking about noxious weeds, we're talking about weeds that are non-native, um, that cause a lot of um, problems in the environment. It, this could be displacing native vegetation. It could be uh, causing uh, stream bank erosion, um, which can be problematic for storm with stormwater issues. Uh, it could be that they also um, can cause uh, banks to destabilize entirely, which could be problematic for streams. Um, some of them are poisonous and some of them are, are uh, toxic in other ways that are dangerous to you, dangerous to livestock and animals. And uh, they can reduce crop yields. So a lot of these are measured against our agricultural programs. So some of what uh, the King County Noxious Weed Program decides upon when they're uh, deciding to list a weed is whether or not it's going to cause any of these concerns, but especially agriculturally, they don't want these weeds in King County moving east of the mountains necessarily, where it can cause even more problems. So there's a lot of work that goes into deciding what's a noxious weed. Um, we're gonna look at a little bit at how they uh, determine um, the different rankings of the weeds and how to manage them and whether they're regulated to be um, pulled or not. And that's all based on their um, spread in the environment. Um, so that's something we're gonna look at uh, in a minute more closely. But I just wanted to point out that uh, the King County Noxious Weed Control Program has an amazing amount of information on their websites. And most of the material that we're talking about tonight is uh, easily found there. I've provided links at the very end for all the resource pages that go to the weeds that I mentioned and you can find more for any of the weeds that you've also mentioned uh, in the chat that we didn't talk about tonight. So I would advise that you keep a good look at that website. Um, there's tremendous amount of information there. Uh, you can call them and get questions. You, they have classes you can attend to learn more. Um, very wonderful resource to help you manage things that um, you don't want growing in your garden. All right, 
And I just wanted to give a little bit of background as to why the surface water utility is, um, is hosting this class and why we're interested in promoting the removal of invasive species throughout the city. Um, so for those of you that aren't um, familiar with surface water, we're talking about all of our natural waterways that are in the city. Uh, so streams, lakes, and Puget Sound included. And our job in the surface water utility is to manage the rain um, so that we are working to prevent flooding throughout the city and also to manage it so that it when it re-enters natural waterways that it has less pollution. And so invasive species, um, can have an effect on the soil such that they make the soil much more compact and unable to soak up water. So we've got this great image here of a nice spongy soil. When we are removing invasives and when we plant native plants and we just have a diversity of plants in our yard, our soil is much more likely to be able to absorb rainwater and return it to groundwater resources where it can trickle back and flow to our streams and lakes and waterways in a natural pattern. And it does so slowly and it just removes a lot of problems. So really getting rid of those invasive species um, is very important. Next slide, please. And so with that, I just wanted to touch on the path of stormwater. Oh, it's it's, trying. Hang it's on. trying for the next. Oh. We've got really big, beautiful photos here that are slowing things down a little bit. Um, so just really quickly, path of stormwater, when water is flowing through the city, it ultimately is getting funneled in most cases down into either storm drains, which we have on the left side of the screen, or into ditches, which you might have in front of your home. Both of these are systems that are connected by pipes and they're meant to move water from our neighborhoods and from all around the city into natural waterways. And so we see at the bottom here, we've got this pipe and it's going directly into the stream. These processes are really, they're old, they're old systems and we're really working on revamping them um, over time, but it's a really, you know, large effort to do that and it comes with redevelopment. And so right now as water moves through these pipes, it is not treated. And so any chemical or any type of pollution that it picks up along the way, even leaves from falling trees, it's all getting condensed um, into these high flows. And so when it rains in large storms, it goes directly into the streams and causes a lot of problem. By removing invasives, we're giving the land that we have that's undeveloped a better chance at really absorbing that water and sending it down to those groundwater resources. Okay, it's nice to be on stormwater. Thank you. And now we can get into the invasive plants. All right, so where do all these invasive species come from? Um, you know, they're here, they've been here for many years. Uh, some of them we're very used to, we, you know, they're ubiquitous to the Northwest. If you look at books like Pojar and McKinnon's Field Guide to Northwest Plants, they will include things like dandelions and ivy and, you know, some of the things that have um, traveled into our, our uh, natural environments and become part of the ecosystem. That doesn't mean necessarily that we want them all there. Some of the things that grow uh, are relatively benign, but other things can have big impacts on our natural environment. So these things have come in by people traveling around the world. Uh, when people first moved across the country or um, people have immigrated here, things have been brought in. Some of them intentionally, you know, by um, people bringing plants from home to, to grow in their new home. Some of them unintentionally, you know, just on the wheels of um, different vehicles or modes of transportation, they come in planes, they might come in cargo or on vehicles that are transporting goods around. So in commercial systems. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about tonight really started with the nursery trade. There were plants that were brought in specifically to grow as landscape plants. And then uh, with the absence of their uh, com competitors in their natural environment, they became dominant and act have crowded out native plants that are slower growers or um, grow at different seasons uh, than some of these do. So a lot of these Invasive noxious weeds will grow earlier in the spring than some of our natives will, and, and that gives them an advantage to outcompete other things. 
We also don't always know that they will become a noxious plant at first. Some things are added to the noxious weed list as time goes on, as we see how they behave in the environment. So, you know, something that may have been seemed benign for a while, all of a sudden becomes a problem and we see it spread very rapidly. Um, when the reproductive success outweighs the success of native plants um, and displaces them, then we consider them invasive. So I'm not gonna go through and read every little thing here and you guys will have access to the recording. And then also I will give um, Christy a copy of the um, PowerPoint as a PDF so you can review it at your leisure. But basically this is how the Noxious Weed Program outlines uh, how they designate whether a weed needs to be managed and at what level they need to be managed. Class A weeds are the things that have the highest priority and um, the eradication of these is required by law throughout Washington. So these are also on the Washington noxious weed list. Class B weeds are limited uh, to portions of Washington. So there might be designations for control in King County, but maybe not in another county where it's not as big an issue. So there's differences there. Sometimes you'll see them as regulated and some as non-regulated. Depends on how widespread they are. So the less widespread they are, the more likely they are to be regulated for control. So it seems a little counterintuitive, but what it means is that if it's not already spread widely, there's a chance that we can eradicate it. And so that's the goal is to try to get rid of it. If it's widely spread, as you'll see as we get further into these designations, uh, then they realize that it's pretty impractical to imagine that we're gonna get rid of all say Himalayan blackberry. Uh, so they don't require us to control that. So the class C weeds uh, like class B are typically widespread in Washington or of special interest to agriculture. Um, this allows counties to control them locally if desired. You'll see that many of the weeds we're talking about tonight are not class C weeds because there, there isn't as much um, concern for agriculture as there is on the East side of the state. Um, but we see a lot of class A, we see some class A, class B, and then these other two um, categories, non-regulated basically could be in the class B or class C category. So those are not an extra category, they just are uh, the part of class B and class C that means that we're not gonna ask you to get rid of them because we realize it's not feasible. And then King County weeds of concern are ones that are not classified as noxious weeds yet, but many weeds from this list end up on the noxious weed list at some point, um, and not always, but they can. And we recognize that these species can impact and degrade habitat. And so we really want to encourage people to manage them. Um, so that's basically how this runs. We're gonna look at where each of these weeds we're gonna look at tonight lives in the um, class uh, designations uh, as we go through the list. So the weeds that we're looking at, and I apologize, I didn't, I was saying earlier, I didn't put blackberry on here, uh, which I meant to do, but we can talk about it when we have questions. Um, and there's plenty of material online at the King County Noxious Weed uh, website. So these are the ones we're gonna talk about. I sort of listed them in an order of what we're likely to see in our gardens, moving into what's less likely necessarily may not be in our garden, but may be in the environment or natural areas or parks or you know, areas that we frequent uh, that we wanna be aware of so that we can um, report them and or uh, know what they look like if you see them in your own garden, but also some of them, if you are participating in a park or helping clean up, you can help to rid the environment of these, these weeds as well. So we'll go through all these. This list actually tells you which, is, which class they're in and each uh, weed page will also say the same. So I wanted to start with butterfly bush because a lot of people don't realize this plant is on the noxious weed list. It's on the noxious weed list because it's really widespread now. It's very, 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 very good at reproducing itself. Yeah, um, one, one flower spike can have 40,000 seeds in it. 
Um, this is a study that Longfellow Gardens in Pennsylvania conducted. So 40,000 seeds in one flower spike on a bush that's, I don't know, eight, 10 feet tall with many, many flower spikes uh, spreads a lot of seed. They, they can spread seed like right around them where it's just like a carpet of, of um, baby uh, seedlings. I have a neighbor right to my north that has one right on the fence line and all of my potted plants in my backyard on my patio have these seedlings in them, even the ones on the far side of the house that are along the driveway where I grow my tomatoes. Those end up with seedlings of Buddleia in it. Um, so this is Buddleia davidii, and um, it grows wild in the woodland edges. It's really, really uh, adaptable along riparian areas, stream banks and river banks. And the big problem with that is that it displaces our native vegetation. And on the our riparian areas, especially uh, displaces willow, which is very important for native butterflies because they lay eggs in the willow for their larva to hatch out on and then eat the willow. That is their food uh, to grow into before they pupate and become a butterfly. Unfortunately, though Buddleia flowers attract butterflies, the leaves do nothing for the larva of our native butterflies. And so as they displace the willow on the stream banks, then we're losing habitat for these species that are native to the Northwest. Um, it's pretty recognizable. It's very fragrant. It does attract butterflies like crazy. Um, the, the leaves are very fuzzy. I've even seen some types of bees that are also not native here use the leaves to create cocoons uh, for their young. Uh, so, you know, every plant has a place in its native uh, habitat. And of course, it would have lots of benefit, but here it's displacing native plants that will support our native fauna, and that's not a good thing. So the way you deal with this plant um, is especially to control the seeds. So even if you have this in your yard, and I know some people won't want to cut it down, people buy it, have bought this in the nursery industry. It's actually on the state quarantine list, so it's illegal to buy, sell, or offer to anybody. Um, and, and But you will still sometimes see it for sale, especially from out-of-state vendors. So if you have this in your yard and you've decided that you want to just manage it, which can be a bit of a challenge, you need to control the seeds so at least that they're not spreading. Ideally, we'd love people to cut this plant down so that it's not spreading its seeds at all. That's a lot of seed to try to contain. But even if you are cutting it down, if it's in flower, you want to bag the, the heads before you cut them off so that they're contained. And then you're gonna put all of that into the garbage can for the landfill. Now the rest of the plant, the stems and all of that can go in yard waste, but you don't wanna put flower heads into the um, yard waste and you don't wanna put it in your compost for sure. They could continue to develop a little bit after they've been cut and you don't know how close they are to being able to disperse seeds. So it's just better not to take that chance. And certainly if, in the, if they're in the seeded stage, you're gonna do this. Once you cut the plant down, you can treat the stump to prevent regrowth, or you can dig the whole thing out. It's a lot of work, but um, once they're gone, then you don't have to deal with that again. We've had to remove some of these from the Rainier Beach Urban Farm Wetland site, um, where it started to invade because we have wetland ground and we have a little slough that runs down the middle of the property where we've planted a lot of willow, but we're starting to see bud leaf pop up there. Manage the seedlings. You'll find them everywhere. Um, they can grow in pavement cracks, cracks so keep, take a good look. I saw some in my parking strip right along the edge of the sidewalk um, growing and it grew very fast from a seedling to about three feet tall in a couple of months. So keep your eye on them. You can find alternatives to replace them. Now the native uh, spirea will work but beware that the Spirea douglasii can also spread in the landscape. So you want to put that somewhere where you can have a plant that spreads. It doesn't spread all over your garden, but it will spread laterally where it's growing. And then of course, lilacs, which have a similar 
look and a nice fragrance. They have a different bloom time. They're earlier in the spring, but they uh, blooms in the summer. And then our friend English Ivy. This is everywhere. It's used as a um, ground cover, which has a very extensive and thick uh, covering over the ground. So it works very well in that case. But the problem with it is that once it becomes a mature plant, it will develop uh, flowers and fruit the birds eat and spread around. <clears throat> Goes into our native uh, woodland areas, uh, grows up trees, um, can displace native vegetation, you know, just on the ground because it carpets things so well. And it's very long lived. Um, one plant has been identified to be at least 400 years old. That's a long, long um, lifespan for a ground cover. Um, the long, uh, it's a vine, so the long stems can grow up to 90 feet in length um, along the ground. It can rot tree bark. It can actually pull trees down from the weight of it, especially as trees brought out from the uh, ivy being uh, smothering up the bark. It can cause slope instability because it's not very deeply rooted uh, and um, doesn't do anything to hold the ground in place. It is evergreen and it grows year round. Uh, when you're looking at the juvenile leaves, they look like what you see in this picture. When they become mature, they get more um, solid, um, an entire margin where they don't have lobes on them anymore. Um, and one of the worst things about ivy to me is that it hosts rats. Lots of rats live in this environment. And uh, it also hosts sooty mold, which is a fungal issue that gets onto other plants, uh, onto plants, which will um, turn into this dark sort of mold on the plant, uh, which can cause uh, allergic reactions. And also um, there's lots of dust in ivy usually, especially in urban areas. So not a great plant. Um, there are about four different varieties that are considered the most invasive, and Hibernica is uh, the one that especially is identified in the Northwest on this side of the mountains. It is non-regulated, but it is a class C weed. This is one that is not likely to become regulated because it is so widespread, but we do recommend people controlling it. At the very least, um, prevent the flowers and fruit from developing if you do nothing else. Um, to manage it, dig small areas out. Um, it actually can come out fairly easy using like a, a garden fork. If you're trying to get it off a tree, cut away at the base of the tree and then as high as you can reach and just let it die in the upper reaches of the tree and clear it away from the base of the tree so it's not gonna grow up it quite as soon. Um, loosen the soil with a weeding fork pull and roll. So in big areas where they're doing restoration, they're pulling a lot of this out, they actually can pull and roll it up and they roll it into sort of this big long um, ball and then cover it and let it sit to die. That could take a couple of years, but I've seen that work when I used to live in Northeast Seattle. I lived near Thornton Creek and one of my neighbors did this all the time in the, in the um, Creek Basin area. And then after it's gone, be sure to mulch the ground and plant something new so that you can uh, be sure to not let any new seedlings come back in. There will probably be seedlings that will come up that you'll have to be paying attention to for a while. So some of, all, some of the alternatives then for um, ivy could be things like Pachysandra, which you see in the top picture, which is a underground um, spreading ground cover that grows in shade. It's very shiny, also evergreen, but minds its business and doesn't move into the woodland. And then also wild ginger, which is a native uh, Sarum canadense, which grows more in big clumps. You can um, move a lot of them around uh, together in an area so that it will fill in and be a solid ground cover. This has an edible rhizome on it that you can use as a substitute for uh, tree ginger. Um, and it smells good and it has some really interesting little flowers. They're not very visible, but it's a, a fun plant. And then of course, English holly. So this also was introduced as an ornamental. This is only on the weeds of concern um, list at the moment. It is recommended for control because it can displace and suppress growth of native trees and shrubs. So, um, City of Kirkland actually is on, has put it on their list of prohibited plants for home landscapes. And, this, and in Seattle, City of Seattle 
a study that was done in native in uh, public forests found that this was the most fourth most abundant non-native plant in, in uh, public forests. And um, I think Scotch broom and um, ivy and um, blackberry were the other three. So these are um, trees that have male and female trees, berries on the female tree. Um, and that's the fruit that causes the issue because again, that gets moved around. It is poisonous uh, to us, and, uh, but birds spread it around and uh, they will drop um, and create seedlings in the vicinity of the tree as well. So scout for those spiky shiny leaves that we all recognize um, and the trees can reach 50 feet tall they create this really really dense shade underneath them and the trees when they're in and really entrenched are really hard to get out so pulling them out when small is really helpful moist soil will help pull out most seedlings so it's important to uh, wet the soil if it's not wet before you try to start removing seedlings from these noxious weeds you can use a weed wrench, just a specialized tool that uses some, helps with mechanics to, to um, pull bigger plants out. They have long tap roots, so they're hard to get out. When they're mature, you have to cut the whole tree down and then you can either treat the stump or if you have an area that's big enough, you can have somebody come in and grind the stump. Sometimes there'll be some regrowth from them. Um, my sister, when she moved into the house she's living in now, they had three holly trees. And they removed two. Um, they, they removed two of them, and then um, had to get help with the third one because it was just overwhelming. Um, it involves a lot of disturbance to the ground to remove these, so it's better to not let them get big in the first place. Some alternatives are like the holly osmanthus, which is um, uh, very much of a look-alike. It has a more, more dense growth form, not quite as tall. Uh, has these incredibly fragrant flowers on it and fruit that the birds will eat. Um, it's a really pretty plant. You'll notice that all um, on the holly um, osmanthus, the leaves are alternating on the stem and on um, true on the, Amer uh, the English holly, they're alternate. So that's one way you can tell the difference between them. And then a native alternative, which doesn't grow to the size of a holly certainly, but has that same sort of shiny spiky leaf as our Oregon grape which is a wonderful plant for uh, the native hummingbirds, the Anna's hummingbirds. In the winter, early, um, they're looking for food in early spring, these guys start to bloom. And so they're, they're great um, food for those guys that have overwintered here. And then the berries uh, develop, you can eat them. Um, my sister used to make wine from them. And then you can also um, let the birds eat them. Sorry, there goes my computer again. Okay, now, now we have a little um, herb uh, that grows on the forest floor. That's probably all over everybody's yards. Uh, it was also introduced as an ornamental. It's a geranium. And so like other um, geraniums, and I don't mean geranium in the sense of the big colorful red flowers, those are pelargonium, but geranium as in our perennial geraniums, like you see in the picture right below it, uh, that purple flower. So there's a lot of beautiful um, varieties of geranium. This one happened to be a little annual version that um, gets out of control in our woodland areas and it suppresses other um, herbaceous vegetation and it can form huge colonies. It has an allelopathic effect, which means that um, it exudes chemicals in its root system that can prevent other native plants from even germinating in that space. So it's kind of, you know, dominates the site. It also attracts pollinators. So the pollinators will go to these plants rather than to our native plants, which they need to be able to reproduce. Um, they, the leaves I call fragrant um, have a very bitter odor. So Herb Robert is the nice name for it. A lot of people call this Stinking Robert or Stinky Bob. And um, it's um, noticeable when you crush the leaf. Very, very fragrant. The plant reproduces from seed. So easy to pull out. You can actually can get the plant out very easily and not leave much vegetative parts behind. 
but the seeds can be viable for five years in the soil. So once it starts seeding, you have it for a while that you have to keep maintaining um, it, the area and pulling them out. And they can eject a long way away. So 15 feet away from each plant. If you have a large colony of that, you're just infesting areas. That's why it spreads so rapidly and, and reinfests the, the same area it's growing in. So ideally, you wanna hand pull these guys so you cause the least amount of disturbance. Um, they're very easy to hand pull, but you have to get to the base of the plant. So you wanna make sure you get down right at the base of the plant, find where it's growing from the soil and pull at the base. Um, you don't wanna to try to pull one leaf, you'll just pull the leaf off because they're very delicate. You can mow them down to prevent them flowering if you have in a, like a big open woodland area where they're growing like crazy. At least you can get ahead of them that way. Uh, it's not gonna kill the plant, but it will prevent them from spreading more seeds. And then you need to keep checking back. And as in the case with ivy, because these dominate large open areas, you wanna mulch and plant those open areas after you remove them and clean off the clothes you were wearing and the boots that we were wearing to minimize spreading the seed because you're gonna uh, get the seed all over yourself as you do this. Uh, alternatives would be other species of geraniums. So the non-invasive varieties, and there's lots of those or our native Pacific bleeding heart, which is beautiful, Dicentra formosa. And this is a, not an evergreen and it's not gonna stay um, present all summer long. These um, stinky bobs actually are uh, present throughout the whole growing season. Uh, bleeding heart is a lot shorter term than that. It grows, it flowers, and then the leaves will die back even before the summer's over. But it's a very beautiful plant and you can intermix that with other things that will take its place as it goes dormant. So we have um, everybody's favorite. Now we're looking at knotweed. Um, so the old, old name for this was Japanese knotweed. It's now called Itadori knotweed. Uh, there are about four different types of knotweed you'll find in the Northwest. This is one of the most common. Um, it was also introduced as an ornamental and you can see in that picture, it's actually quite beautiful when it's in bloom. Um, it's really great. Uh, bee food late in the season for honeybees who stay out later than a lot of our native bees do. So a lot of uh, beekeepers love this plant. We just need to find um, alternatives for that for a late summer bloom. Uh, it's also on the state quarantine list. It's non-regulated for most of King County except in areas um, along the Green River where they've designated that they're going to control it. Um, it is recommended for control though, and it dis does displace native, native vegetation, again, along riversides, it likes moist soils, it could be along road edges, it grows in large colonies and sort of wetland plant um, uh, displacement. It causes bank erosion because it's deciduous in the winter, and so it dies down. There may be stems still in, in place, but there's no foliage anymore. So the rain just beats on the hillside and it's displaced everything else that could help hold that hillside in place. The root systems are very extensive. They spread by underground stem or rhizome and uh, they can go you know, 12 feet into the ground. They can pop up through concrete, up, come up through your siding on the side of your house. They're very strong. Um, it is also an edible plant. So you could you know, start eating the young shoots of it and um, be persistent uh, with trying to maintain it. And that is one way people take care of this is that they pull up at small areas. Um, you can maintain that by doing it for a period of three years and you usually get rid of it. You can alternate techniques to how you're exhausting the root system by cutting it, mowing it, pulling it, tilling it, and then covering the area. So doing that uh, interchange of types of techniques that will help um, deter it can um, work pretty well. Larger areas sometimes require the use of herbicides and the King County Noxious Weed Program actually will um, teach you about that. They have injectors they can train you to use and um, then you are allowed to use that on your own property. You inject herbicide directly into a cut stem these stems are hollow when they're cut and you direct um, the herbicide down in. You do it at certain times a year when the plant is translocating nutrients to its roots so that it will um, be strong in the root system in, dor in the dormant period. And then if you put the herbicide in, then you're gonna get a better kill on it. 
Um, but anytime you're using herbicides, of course, you want to follow label instructions. You want to be trained in how to do it. You want to wear safety gear and you're putting yourself at risk. So try not to let this get out of hand is really the ticket here. If you have a little bit on your property, get ahead of it. Um, be persistent. Go out there every month and do it. Take it out. And then in some cases you can use, once you get it cut down, you can use landscape fabric and cover it up. You need to make sure that you have it, um, and there's a typo in this, I apologize, 10 feet from the outside stems. So if your outside um, stem of your little patch of knotweed, you know, go 10 feet out from that if you can, because it will spread underground and come back up. So some alternatives are things like Fothergilla, which is a lovely little um, deciduous shrub, which has sort of a plumy flower, or goat's beard, which is a native, uh, and especially in those shadier areas. It has um, not quite the same look, but a more similar look, and is a, a great native plant for our environment and pollinators in the Northwest. But you can also think about, uh, since knotweed takes over a whole huge area, that you do a whole new planting in this area. It doesn't have to be plant for plant. You can put in a, a variety of species of plants uh, to create a new planting because it, it takes up more space than you realize. And once you move, remove it, you realize how much garden space you have. Just giving this time to catch up to me. There we go. All right. Now I know this is everybody's favorite bindweed. I think we hear about bindweed more than anything. We made a little uh, movie about it a video about it um, for the Garden Hotline, which is on the Garden Hotline's YouTube site. It has been the most um, watched video of all that one and the one about moles, but bindweed I think is above that. Uh, this is a very difficult weed to eradicate. So it's on the weed of concern list because uh, we realize that it's not gonna be very practical to expect people to get control of this. Suppression is most likely a result you're going to have when you have this in your garden. You can, if you are persistent, um, get rid of it, but it, it has a lot of things going for it that keeps it successful. Uh, the way it grows, the kinds of spaces it can grow in, tiny little cracks where it grows up between plants. It can climb up in some other plants. It can climb up on structures, on your rooftop, on your fence posts, on your fences. And it, it's really difficult to get because it's winding around everything. And so when you're trying to get rid of it, you know, you want to just rip it off, but you're dropping pieces on the ground. If you don't pick all those up, they will reroot and grow. So very successful, any part of the stem, any part of the underground the rhizome, any part of the roots that are on those underground stems. It has seeds uh, that are viable for um, 20 years. And so lots of ways that it propagates itself. It's a beautiful flower, um, very pretty. There are There is a little uh, golden beetle that can eat this plant, but it doesn't ever get rid of it. It just puts holes in the leaves. So it's not effective as a biocontrol. Um, and then you see, this is uh, the field bindweed and you see the, the hedge bindweed, which has smaller flowers and leaves. Um, so you want to remove seedlings before they get established and while the ground is wet. Uh, you can cover this with plastic, landscape fabric, or cardboard and let it sit over a growing season in open infested areas or longer. And part of what happens when you do that is it's sort of, um, I don't, don't want to say trick because these plants aren't like aware of what you're doing to them, but they are responding to what you do to them. And they will come up in the soil. So the rhizomes will be higher in the soil level than they would be if you were uh, to have it in the open um, and photosynthesizing. And then you get more rhizomes um, out of the ground. So it's a way to clear the ground more quickly. You certainly don't want to compost this. You can put it into yard waste bins. If you are going to apply herbicides, fall is the time to do it because again, the chemicals will translocate to the roots. And you wanna be persistent um, plant uh, after you've replaced or pulled it, plant things and keep an eye out for seedlings or sprouts. So some, you know, if you're trying to grow something vertically where the morning glory was growing, you can grow actually 
true mooring glory, which is in the bottom picture. These are different uh, gen genera uh, entirely. They're not the same plant. Uh, the true morning glories will drop seeds and make babies, but they don't grow by rhizome and spread everywhere like the um, bindweed does. Well, you could use other annual vines like sweet peas or green beans or peas in those places, or you can try things like clematis. But in reality, when you're pulling this plant, you're not always replacing it because you're just trying to get it out of growing where it's growing on plants you already have in place. Um, so it's it's fun. Uh, garlic mustard. So this is a plant not a lot of people are aware of. It was introduced as an edible and medicinal plant. It is on the class A list regulated. So anything on class A is required to control. Uh, you'll see it sometimes in natural areas, woodland areas and, and forests and parks. It is on the state quarantine list. Um, and one of its successful uh, ways that it grows is that it matures early. And so it outcompetes slower growing native understory plants. It comes up earlier and then it goes, matures faster, sets seed and takes advantage of the season earlier than our native plants do. It can inhibit beneficial mycorrhizae in the soil. Uh, it has a phytotoxin uh, that it spreads and, and that's not helpful because our forests depend on that uh, relationship with the mycorrhizae in the soil. It can disturb the life cycle of some of our native um, creatures like some butterflies and salamanders. This is a biennial plant. So in the first year, it's just a rosette and then it will grow in the second year to set the flowers and seeds, which can be viable for 10 years. It also colonizes because of its effects of um, inhibiting other plants from growing around it. And so, it's just setting this huge uh, seed crop in the soil that's there for a long time. If you don't get the whole taproot out, uh, it can resprout from the tops. And so it's important to not just like pull at it, but actually, you know, loosen the soil and, and dig it out. Um, it does have a distinctive garlic smell. And again, you want to clean boots and clothing to avoid spreading this plant. Um, it's easy to, easier to pull when in flower because then it's distinguishable. The, the smell is distinguishable, but once you see those flowers, you'll know what you're looking for. Some of our native um, herbs or forbs like fringe cup um, and piggyback plants, those guys look like similar to this. This is in the mustard family. It is an edible plant and that garlic smell is, you know, part of the the package of being edible, um, but it's it's terribly um, terribly displacing to native plants. Um, when you pull this, you want to bag and dispose of the entire plant, especially if you're waiting till those flowers develop, and then put that in the trash. You don't want to use this. Put this in any compost you have at home. You don't want to put it in the yard waste um, bin. And you want to return the following spring to the same area to see if there's any more babies coming up. Um, if you have a lot of large patches of this and you don't have time to actually pull in any given year, you can cut down when it's flowering or prevent it from flowering, cut it down and um, not let it spread, but be sure to clean off any equipment you use. Um, better to cut it by hand and then clean those um, uh, tools, hand tools off. Sometimes herbicides are necessary and, and King County Notches Weed Program really wants you to report where you see this and also tell, um, they can tell you um, sort of guidelines about how to manage it where, where you have it. Uh, for, uh, French cup is a nice alternative to this. It's a nice uh, native uh, ground cover that you'll see in the forest floor in the saxifrage family and then also heuchera or coral bells there's lots of those that are ornamentals um, that are all related to each other, um, both these plants. So garlic mustard is something you should keep your eye out for um, in, especially in uh, public spaces. Um, policeman's helmet is another one of those that we see sort of going wild that was an ornamental. It's an impatience that grows very tall. It has this cute little flower on it. Um, but it's like uh, knotweed can um, displace native vegetation in riparian areas and create big patches where the soil gets bare. A lot of runoff happens from those. If it's on street edges, same thing. Uh, soil will run off and then go into the street and then down the drains. So keeping this controlled in, is helpful. It is regulated for control. 
Um, so if you have it on your property, you are required to remove it. Uh, we saw this at um, pea patch I used to garden in in Seattle and we had to remove it. It was on a hillside where the knotweed was growing as well. So lots of uh, noxious weeds on that hill. One plant can produce 800 seeds annually. So that's a lot of seeds. Um, they disperse their seeds 20 feet away. So they sort of pop when you touch the seed pod. And um, they're often dispersed downstream uh, because they're in wet areas. So the seeds pop into the water and then move down the stream um, into the other banks that may not be infested. It's a very tall plant, uh, not like the small impatiens we grow in our gardens. And then um, King County Noxious Weed uh, Program wants you to report this one. There's the, um, the um, link for that. You can get customized advice again regarding removal. And then for small stands, you can hand pull them. You wanna bag the seed head when pulling and um, put the seed head into garbage like you do with Budlia. You don't want this to get loose. And then again, the same thing. You can um, mow it, but don't do it when it's not in flower or seed. Uh, because when it is um, in flower or seed, because it will, you'll spread those. So you need to mow it when it's just vegetative. It will sprout and need to be mowed or cut again, but it is an alternative way to sort of do a quick and dirty um, take down of it without having to pull it completely out until you're ready to do that. Salmonberry is a great alternative for this. Um, mixed with other things, I would say, if you're, if you're looking at um, banks or um, slopes, you want to mix with other things that aren't deciduous, so some uh, evergreen plants as well that will help hold the hillside. But in other flatter areas, salmonberry will spread underground. You do have to sometimes contain that, but it's um, it does play well with others. You can grow other plants with it as well, and it gives you an edible fruit um, or one that animals will eat. It's trying. All right, so poison hemlock. Poison hemlock is in all kinds of um, abandoned fields, sides of roads. I've seen it at the junction where the, the old viaduct uh, off ramp onto Elliott um, was, or Western, there by the Pike Place Market, and just a little triangle of land. You see along. Um, you know, some of the pond areas down by the First Avenue South Bridge, it's everywhere. This plant is a class B regulated plant on public land. So it is recommended for control only on private lands. If you have it in your yard, you're not required to remove it, but it would be wise to since it's toxic. It is required for control on public land. It displaces native vegetation. All these guys, you know, really crowd other things out um, and, and take advantage. It's a biennial, so it grows to 10 feet in its second year. And this plant can produce 40,000 seeds per plant that are viable for six years. So really successful at reproducing itself. It is acutely toxic, including the dead plant parts that might still be standing. Those can be toxic for three years. And it has the same capacity of uh, like um, giant hogweed that it has plant oils that can burn, burn your skin in reaction to sunlight, which many things in this family do. This is the carrot family. So some people are even sensitive to carrot greens and carrot flowers. Just be aware of that um, potential with this plant family. It's dangerous for livestock because when it's growing, it's small, you may not notice that it's growing um, in your field because it could look like Queen Anne's lace or something else and you don't notice it and they eat it and it can poison them. Um, distinctive when it's growing taller, the stems have purple spotting that's pretty distinctive and this finely, finely divided leaf. Uh, but it does look like carrot when it's young. You want to uh, wear protective clothing always when you remove this. You want to especially have on gloves and long sleeves. You don't want to get these oils on your skin. You don't want to, in, um, you can, in, you know, in, not ingest it, but in, um, it'll, it'll soak into your skin. Even if you have cuts on your skin, you don't want to uh, run the risk of um, getting any of this poison toxicity into you. You want to hand dig them. They have a tap root, so you need to dig down, remove the entire plant, put the whole thing in the garbage for the landfill. landfill. You don't want to mow or weed eat this plant because you're just spreading the oils and, and the dust that comes off of it when it's dry. It's all toxic and the plants will regrow anyway. Um, and then always remove, remove seed heads to avoid spreading it. So 
if it's starting to go into seed when you're going to dig it up, um, bag up those seed heads first and then cut them off the plant, throw that away and then remove the plant. So some of the other plants in this family that could be good substitutes include things like lovage, uh, which is a wonderful herb, uh, very strong celery uh, tasting. Uh, it has again, the same kind of growth. It grows up and then puts up this big tall stem with the big umbrella shaped flower in the APACA family. Fern leaf biscuit root or lamatium also does the same has and dill would be other plant that would look like similar to this. So a lot of plants in this family that can take the place. Typically when you're removing this, you're not trying to remove it to replace. It's usually you're removing it because it's on your property and it's poisonous and it will grow wherever it decides to grow. So it may not even be something that you had intended to grow. Giant hogweed, another plant, same family, umbrella shaped flower, grows long stream banks, roadsides. This is a class A regulated weed required for control, causes terrible burns um, if you get the oil on your skin and in, in, in sunlight, um, you could get scarring, you can get uh, burns that have disfiguration, um, pigment in, hyperpigmentation, which can occur for many years. Um, so it's not a fun plant to play with. Um, takes up to four years after it germinates to flower, so you have some good time you know, to, to get it out. Uh, it outcompetes slower growing native plants. It also tolerates seasonal flooding. So it's gonna be fine there and the seeds will get dispersed in stormwater. You know, even if the area floods, it's not gonna hurt it. Um, so it's, it's huge too. It's a very big plant up to 15 feet with flower. Um, and again, has the hollow stem with purple blotches like the um, other, the other um, sorry, <sighs> the poison hemlock does. So again, where, protection when working around this plant, include eye protection on this because this sap is worse than the other ones. Um, in small areas, you can hand dig, use smaller hand tools to cause minimal disturbance. These are often on slopes. The stems break it very easily. So you don't wanna just grab at a stem. Actually, it's easier to remove the tops, take all the tops down and then open up so you can like take a few leaves off so you can get into where the um, roots of the plant are and, and dig it out more easily with less exposure to touching the plant. Um, you wanna come back in the spring again, don't weed whack again, like the poison hemlock, you don't wanna do that. Uh, that's dangerous to do. Uh, you wanna replace it if you have this in your garden or if you just like the look of it and wanna put a plant in that's similar, Gunnerum monocata is a great substitute, also gets big, huge leaves. Um, and then cardoon, which would grow in drier areas. So these are also big architectural plants that are pretty to look at. Um, and then purple loose strife. So this is a plant that we see in wetland areas. Um, it was introduced in, as an ornamental and then was continually reintroduced for a long time. So it just kept getting worse and worse. It is class B, it is regulated. It's required to control it. It's on the state quarantine list. You can't transport these wild plants as well as not sell it or transport or you know anything uh, by or sell. It displaces, again, native vegetation, riparian areas, gets into the water, um, impedes water flow, displaces nesting habitats, waterfowls, and a plant can produce 2 million seeds and also reproduces by root fragmentation. So this plant is incredibly successful at reproducing itself and um, can harm a lot of um, natural areas. You wanna report this one if you find it, um, and again, it's the same principle, hand dig small colonies, bag them, put in the garbage. You can, if you have a lot of seedlings in an area, and this might not, you may have this, but not in a wet area, um, but you can <clears throat> put pl plastic over it if you have a lot of seedlings. If you are boating in areas where there are infested waters, just avoid that area or clean your boat very thoroughly. Um, really avoiding it is better and then clean your clothes off um, after working with it. And some alternatives are things like Liatris and Ligularia. And some people have planted, like I said, this was introduced as an ornamental, so it was planted on, pur on purpose. 
So a lot of the principles that are used in managing weeds um, are the same as any pests that we manage in our environment and our gardens um, by using integrated pest management. And some of the techniques I talked about um, involve multiple steps, could involve trying one thing and then another. Uh, and it depends on whether it's widespread or a small patch. So integrated pest management is just using, a, it's a decision-making approach to managing pests by combining different kinds of tools, including biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools. And what our point is, is to try and minimize economic health and environmental risks. And this is what the whole point of, you know, managing nox noxious weeds is about um, in the long run, it's all those things. So the, these are the techniques that we think about when we're deciding um, how to manage things. Um, when you're looking at steps of IPM, first of all, you want to prevent by not planting any of those kinds of plants in the first place or um, observing, you know, monitor to see if you have them. Do you have those plants in your garden? Is, is this an issue you need to take care of? And then intervention um, would be the case for most of these weeds is that you want to actually remove them. So you can start with the least impact by digging and then move to chemical treatments if you need to, um, if it's just a, um, a bear to get out. Um, one thing I wanted to point, it out, point out is there is a biological control program for loose strife using these little beetles that will eat the plant. And so in some areas, when, one reason they really want you to report it, and especially if you have it on your own property, um, they, because they may have released beetles in the area and so um, part of the success of this is to have the plants there for the beetles to eat. And so there's a sort of a fine balance that they're trying to strike with um, keeping some plants with, that the beetles can eat and destroy uh, the plant. And when you call them and tell them you've seen a patch, they can alert you to whether this is um, actually being employed in that area or not. There aren't a lot of biological controls for most of the plants we've seen. Uh, tansy ragwort has had, the cinnabar moth has been one of the, um, the larva of that uh, moth actually has been one of the controls. And so there are some things that happen, but not, there's not a lot um, for the things that we looked at. When you are using chemicals, remember that all chemicals have potential toxicity. So always use the least toxic one first. Use it as a last resort. Make sure you always read and follow the label instructions. Don't think that more is better. It's not, it doesn't do anything more to the plant, um, just puts you at more risk. And then the growsmartgrowsafe.org actually has some um, great uh, charts showing you toxicity of different chemicals um, and helps you look at what choices you might make for a certain um, problem. And then you can look and see, um, is this toxic to the environment? Is it toxic to me? Pick one that's least toxic um, and uh, start with that. So it's a great tool to help you make those choices. Um, you can uh, look at it, it's online. You can look at it when you're at the store, at the garden center or the nursery and trying to pick a product out too. There's also a weed watcher program for King County. So if you wanna adopt an area to watch for invasive weeds, this is great. You could be, you know, in your, your own um, neighborhoods, uh, helping to make sure that people are aware where the noxious weeds are, and you're working directly with King County on this. Um, and you help pull things out, you help educate other people. There's uh, the for sort of the forest team, and then there's a team that works in more aquatic um, riparian areas as well. So if I'd encourage you to get involved with that if you're interested. And then here's for Christine. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I just wanted to put in a quick plug for our Soak It Up rebate program. If you are a shoreline property owner, then you might be eligible for this rebate. We provide rebates uh, for property owners to either convert a lawn, some invasive weeds, or a hardscape to native landscaping. Um, we also provide a rebate for building a rain garden. Um, in order to determine whether you are eligible or not for this program, um, you would need to have a site visit conducted. I would come out for that site visit. Um, so please shoot me an email. I'll put my email into the chat if you're interested in seeing if you're eligible. Um, I wanted to highlight it here because 
It sounds like some of you might have large areas of invasive plants in your yard. And if you want to remove those um, and instead add some native plants, then uh, this would be a great program for you. So uh, get in touch with me. Thank you. So there's two resource pages here. I'll just briefly mention what they're about. Um, again, you'll have access to this so you can um, go through it at your leisure, but there's lots of books that can help you learn more about um, uh, noxious plants, about weeds, about um, alternative plants. And this is especially looking at alternatives. All these sites have wonderful um, opportunities to pick out plants. Um, the Go Native site for King County is pretty great. It's got, um, uh, you can actually go through all the plant lists and create yourself a little list that will get emailed to you. Uh, so you don't have to take notes. Um, then the King Conservation District Plant Sale um, is they're gearing up to get all that online right now. So this is a, a great way to get a lot of plants. So if you ripped out a bunch of ivy and you need a whole bunch of plants, you can get bare root plants at a cheaper price great way to plant them, nice time to plant them. Um, so that happens usually in the early spring. And um, by November, they should have information on their website. I, I saw that the 2022 info is, is there, but they don't have everything up yet. Um, and then the next um, resource is just this long list. These are all the uh, fact sheets for all the weeds we talked about. Um, and there's more, all the other ones that you know we're concerned about as well like blackberry and some of the other uh, English laurel and some of the things that you guys mentioned. So I um, you know, encourage you to investigate, you know, figure out which things you're dealing with, what are, what are your biggest concerns. Uh, you're welcome to call the garden hotline and ask us questions. Also the uh, weed program folks are available for, for this as well. And if you know, we may refer, refer you back to them if, um, if it's something more uh, intensive that you need help with. And one last slide, if it's gonna go. There we go. So here's contact information for us at TILF. Uh, I'm giving you directly the garden hotline number because that's where you've called to ask plant questions anyway. Um, we're there Monday through Saturday from nine to five. Sometimes we're out in the field, sometimes we're doing outreach. Um, we have phones, voicemail, e email, um, you can talk to us on our social media if you'd rather do that um, either way, um, but feel free to contact us about questions about specifically about what's going on in your yard. And that's what I got for tonight. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Hey, so before I let you off the hook and we start answering these Q&As, I would love if you could talk just a little bit about both the Blackberry Oh, sure. Um, sure. And then also, if you could touch on periwinkle as well. Yes. I've been seeing that a lot in shoreline. So blackberry is ubiquitous to the Northwest. We, you know, love picking the fruit. It's not going anywhere. And this is the Himalayan blackberry that's so invasive. If you have it on your property, you know, manage it, pick the fruit. Don't let the fruit spread as much as you can. The birds eat it. Sometimes, you know, you can't get ahead of that. Um, but you know, you can control the patch, you can keep it small. Um, it's to get it out is actually pretty simple, it's work, but it can be pretty successful in a, a year's time easily. You can do it actually in one sitting if it's not terribly entrenched. Blackberry can root by the stem. So anywhere the stem touches, it will create a new plant and grow back up again. So it makes a thicket very fast. It also spreads by the fruit and the seeds of the, of the uh, fruit itself. So um, you wanna get in there and cut it back, much like you would do with the hogweed. You wanna cut back to expose where the actual clumps of roots are. Because like I said, if it's spreading and touching the ground and rooting, you're gonna have multiple points of rooting that you need to deal with. So cut back what you can, expose this, the bare stems at the bottom, and then you're gonna just go to each section and dig it out. Now, wet soil, garden fork, deeply, you know, rocking that in the soil can help loosen it so that you can pop it out. You can use weed wrenches on the grandmother and grandfather plants that have gotten very old and big. The canes can get quite thick. You wanna wear um, leather gloves when you're doing this. It's gonna 
you know, poke you pretty hard. Um, it's a pretty um, successful plant, but it's also um, because the roots are not deep, they're not widespread. Once you get that clump out, you're going to pretty much eradicate it. Uh, we had uh, some infestations again at the pea patch I gardened out where one hill was full of knotweed and um, jewelweed, and the other one was full of blackberry. And we managed to get uh, all the blackberry out. The knotweed was a different story. We just kept cutting it down. But um, the blackberry actually was gone and hasn't come back since. And we planted a bunch of native plants in that area, and it's, it's all growing fine. It, you know, it can regrow if birds start spreading seeds around again. Um, so you just have to keep your eye out for it. It grows very fast. Um, so don't delay on that, you know, um, get out what you can before it starts to become a big, huge um, problem. Now, if you do want to use herbicides on this, this is a plant you would cut back and then apply. You can apply herbicides to the stem in the fall. It'll translocate back where you can leave a little bit of leaf on there and spray them, but actually it's better to do like sort of a cut and dab um, on the stem of the plant. And when the, in the fall, it pulls it back into the root system and kills the plant more entirely. So that's really more recommended if you have like this huge expanse of it um, to do. Again, you know, anytime you're using herbicides, you're putting yourself at risk as well. And then periwinkle is the vinca, like there's vinca minor and vinca major. Vinca major is a little more of a problem, but vinca minor too can take off and really invade areas. Um, another uh, ground cover that does that is hypericum as well, which can just infest an area. And then it's great if that's all you want growing there, uh, like ivy, but um, vinca again, will root anywhere it touches on the stem, and, but the root system is shallow. So again, you can wet soil, um, loosening with a garden fork, starting at the edges, finding where those, those root zones are, root systems are, and just pulling those out as you go. Kind of like the ivy, you can do it sort of um, logistically from one edge to another and sort of roll it as you go, as you start getting it out. So that part of the reason for doing that is it's less time consuming. So you can pull these out and throw them in all directions, throw them on a tarp, anything you want. But when you do this, you actually are, um, you're saving time by not having to move and dispose of that piece you just pulled out. You just actually wanna loosen that piece out. You don't wanna detach it from the rest of the plant. You just wanna roll the whole thing up as you go. And I've, I've removed patches of it doing it that way. Um, it, you know, all of this, none of this is like, not labor intensive, it is labor intensive, but it can be done. The thing with ivy and things like vinca is they have shiny waxy leaves. It's hard to use herbicides on them anyway um, because of that. So it's not, and it's a lot of ground to cover and a lot of leaves to cover, cover. you're not gonna get them all. So really digging and um, pulling the roots out is the way to go with these guys. Thank you, Laura. That's great. Um, and that's a really nice segue into a handful of our questions. Um, so there were some questions regarding recommendations for different types of herbicides for different plants. And um, I just want to take a quick moment to, to state, you know, we really are focused on trying to go use that manual method first. So use all of our tools in the toolbox before we turn to chemical controls. For some of these, I mean, not weed very notoriously is one that we typically turn and use a little bit of an herbicide, but you do put yourself at risk whenever you're using an herbicide. It is meant to, it's meant to sort of just wipe things out and kill. Um, and so you put yourself at risk. You also, you know, are putting other portions of your garden at risk too, um, to really harm the soil potentially um, and other plants around it. So there is a time and a place, um, but please don't turn to that tool first. Um, so just with that, soapbox statement. Yes. <laughs> and I would have, I have the same soapbox. Soap box. Um, I, I don't like to recommend specific herbicides. I think you should look at the Grow Smart uh, site. I think you should talk to the noxious weed folks who have, you know, um, done, invested so many hours and knowing exactly which thing they use for what and when. Um, that being said, glyphosate, which is in Roundup, is one of those chemicals that comes up again and again for the use on um, noxious weeds. 
but they have to be used in a very specific way. You don't want to just spray things. You want to treat them in a very specific way, and you should be trained in how to do that. And the noxious weed folks can talk to you about that. So they're really the ones to talk to about the herbicides and also um, about your infestation and how bad it is and whether it, it, it needs that um, treatment or not. Thank you. I just put the contact information or at least the website for Grow Smart, Grow Safe in there. And then on uh, the slide previous to this, Laura had had all the, the worksheets um, or the web links for each one of the weeds that would talk about if chemical control is needed, how you might approach that. So thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna pop open this Q&A now at long last. Um, so back to our first question. If I have English ivy on a steep slope along the fence line in my yard, how can I safely pull or dig it out so I don't fall into a literal rat's nest while wrestling it? That's a really good point. I'd start at the bottom and work up. Um, I think that would be easier partly because uh, the, the ivy is usually growing down the hill. And so um, start at the bottom and do that um, pull and roll a technique. Uh, you'll have, because you're doing that, you'll have um, an eye uh, on um, where the holes in the hillside are ahead of time. You're not coming from the top, stepping down into them. You're, so it's, it's less likely that you'll um, have an issue with that. And you'll be able to, you'll be able to see it ahead of time. Um, so my general advice in any weeding is always to have a good visual um, eye, uh, sight line for how you're managing these weeds. So you're not like right in the middle of it, just trying to pull things, but start at an edge, move to the center, um, really get out what you're working on first, you know, uh, with IV and Vinca, roll it up as you go. Uh, all of that will help. Great. Thank you, Laura. Um, are any of the flowering noxious weeds included in wildflower seed packets? Some of them, like butterfly weed, look familiar in that context. Some of them could be, so like the butterfly bush, not likely, it's a, it's a woody shrub, but it could be, depends on where you get it. Um, really look for, if you're looking for wildflower mixes, and I tend not to use mixes because I'd rather create my own, so I buy varieties of seeds that I mix together myself. Um, but it, there are some really good uh, wildflower mixes, that being said. Um, look for Pacific Northwest blends from reputable um, seed uh, purveyors. Uh, you don't want to just get it from, you know, somebody in Michigan that may not have the Pacific Northwest in mind. Uh, so uh, because there may be plants that are perfectly fine for them to grow, but not good here. And that's how these things get spread. Um, which is why, again, I use single seeds. So I pick out the wildflowers that I want to grow and then I seed them. Sometimes what happens is you have um, perennial and annual seeds in the same packet and they grow very differently and the perennials are going to lag behind and they take more time to grow. And so you'll just get this rush of annual seeds that annual weed, uh, not weeds, but annual wildflowers that aren't what you had in mind. So you know, plan, plan your wildflower garden. Um, you might want to plant plants of things like echinacea rather than seed them directly in the ground and then put some annual, you know, clarkia and other things like that around it. I'm also just going to include a link right here. Um, there is, I believe it's a pledge that you can take um, to help remove some invasive plants from the Washington noxious weeds, the Washington state noxious weeds, um, and they will send you a pollinator, so native plants mix. So um, I've yeah. used that one before and that was that, a... That's a... That's a good one because they're paying attention and, and but beware that that is also one that has annual and perennial seeds. So you know, look at that. You want to know what those seedlings look like too, so you don't pull them out when they yeah. grow, because you think yeah. they're weeds. So get yeah. to know what the new, the, you know, the cotyledons and the first uh, new leaves look like on those plants. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, and you mentioned this a little bit, but maybe you can talk about the waxy leaves again and why that doesn't work with herbicides as well. But this or, um, this question was along the same lines as the question about herbicide recommended for bindweed. Are there a recommended herbicides for treating English ivy? Um, 
Yeah, again, I don't, I'm not comfortable just recommending herbicides, but to say to you, um, for, to go to the noxious weed folks and look at what they say, they do have specifics about bindweed that can work, again, um, uh, applied in certain ways. You wanna be aware if you use glyphosate on anything, glyphosate is not selective. It will kill any plant in your yard and it will kill your lawn really well. It's a great grass killer. So be aware that if you're using that, you run the risk of damaging other plants. Um, but ivy is very difficult to control with herbicides because of its waxy leaf coating. It takes a lot of herbicide and a lot of spraying and it's not worth doing that. It's not ecologically sound to do that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pull up a comment that was placed a while ago in the chat. Um, is it okay to cut down holly and put it in the compost bin? Yes. And I think it's, yeah, maybe if you could just talk a little bit more generally too about, and I can, I can chime in too. I know it's a, a little different city by city, but yeah. yeah. How, how do we dispose of these weeds? Safely? So the noxious weed folks have a lot of recommendations for when you put things where um, seeded things, if you have holly berries, maybe you don't want to put those in the, in the compost bin. You certainly don't want them in your own compost pile. So if you're putting in fruiting, fruited plants or seeded plants, that should probably go in the garbage because that's stuff that um, is hard to kill in composting and sometimes gets spread. Plants that have vegetative rep reproduction sometimes are hard to kill. Now bindweed um, can go in um, as far as most um, Yard waste collections can go, but it's soft tissue and it can die, it can be killed very easily. Um, something else that's more pernicious, like knotweed uh, roots, uh, may not. So that shouldn't go into the yard waste. So part of it is um, knowing, you know, which which things are more uh, noxious in terms of reproductive um, capacity, but also the noxious weed um, King County site look for those specific plants and read what they tell you about them because they have the best knowledge on, on that and they're staying on top of it because it changes. Some of it has to do with whether the compost company will um, allow you to have it. So, you know, a city may have a certain collection going on, um, but if Cedar Grove doesn't want it, they're gonna tell you, no, you can't put that in the yard waste. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of other weeds of concern for um, our attendees here. So buttercup is taking over somebody's orchard, Kim's orchard. And another issue is black locust tree that was cut and now uh, oh. spurting out the roots have taken over the garden. Yeah, uh, it's hard to get rid of things like black locust. You have to um, get rid of the stump. Uh, sometimes that means cut, uh, um, Right, stump grinding. So sometimes treating a stump, you can do it with herbicides, but you can also do, you can kill roots by burning them out, not by fire, but by using um, chemicals that will actually superheat the wood inside of it and, and melt the wood. Um, so that's one way that people do that. Um, you have to get rid of the stump so that it doesn't keep trying to grow. Um, but with black locusts, there could be roots that run through your garden that are big that may also have to be removed. And that's, um, I'm sorry to tell you that because that's a lot of work, uh, but they are pretty pernicious. Um, and they can also be, um, have a little apathic effects on plants um, and inhibit things from growing like, also like a black walnut can do. Buttercup um, is actually easier to manage than people think. It's easy to pull if you use the method of coming from the edges, um, finding where it's rooted, using a garden fork, wet soil, loosen it up, pull that piece out, and then keep going. <coughs> it likes wet soils. If you can change the drainage at all, if you can add lime to the soil, sometimes that will discourage it. It likes acidic soils. Um, so there are ways to make it in, uh, inhospitable to it uh, that can help, <coughs> excuse me, as well. And I know somebody mentioned laurel earlier on. Laurel is one of those plants too that is like blackberry, it's not going anywhere. Um, keeping it trimmed, don't let it flower, don't let it fruit. 
if it's if it's a useful plant to you if it's not cut it down remove it uh, because the birds spread it all through the forest as well so it's another forest tree that's displacing other things it's english laurel specifically yeah thank you for mentioning that one I've been really surprised um, as I've sort of learned about plants on my own learning journey, but how many of these are still sold commercially, yes. even though they we're learning that they're incredibly problematic. Yeah, so, and it, it's a process for any legislation to happen to make it law to prohibit them from being sold. So it's a long journey to get those things listed. Mm -hmm. um, even, you know, butterfly bush is not supposed to be sold but still is you can buy it you know through catalogs from other places there are hybrids of butterfly bush that aren't as problematic but we don't know all of that yet and and in some cases they may seem okay like they did when they first you know these plants first came into our gardens they seemed well mannered and then took off with the absence of their own competitors um, so even the varieties of budleya we're not sure about all of them yet you know, whether they are okay or not. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I had a question about the timing of removal. Is there a good time of year for some of these invasive plants that we should really be trying to get out there and remove them? That's a great question. So I, I guess there's a couple of windows that are important. Um, wet soil helps, so spring and fall. Um, fall can be really helpful because the plant is trying to put energy into its roots and there's no top, you know, a lot of top growth is dying back. And so it doesn't have any reserves. So pulling things out in the fall can be more successful in the long run because you've removed so much of the plant and it can't, you know, it's like there's nothing there to help it grow. Um, but I think either spring or fall when they're either dying back or when they're young and just coming up, just emerging, it's harder to get them out in the summer when the soil's hard. And when they're in full growth, it's way more work too. So like blackberry, for instance, dies back. You could wait until um, fall, let it die back and then whack out all the dead, dead stems and canes and then find, you can see the roots where the roots are more easily and dig them out much more easily. Um, so it's gonna be less volume of material for you to deal with too in the long run. So deciduous things, maybe fall is a great time because of that. Um, you also, for things like biennials that grow and then put out their flower in the second year, getting them in that first year is ideal before they can ever get to a flowering stage. Um, so anything that's biennial um, would grow as a sort of a, just a clump in the first year um, and then send up a tall shoot with a flower on it after. Great, thank you. I think by choosing those cooler seasons as well, for some of those, you're going to avoid trampsing upon a, a bee's nest, hopefully, as well. Which That to too, in some or, of yeah, or a yellow jacket nest, which yeah. you don't want to get into. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a question here um, about allium and it wondering if it's considered bad for the Northwest and why can I get it in local nurseries, but not from Brex? Oh yeah. So yes, I was just looking at Brex. So they do not mail allium to the Northwest, to Idaho or Washington or Oregon, I think. Um, so allium is a generic, uh, it was a genera, generic, exactly. It's the genera name for uh, onion family plant. Um, so allium bulbs, which are decorative, which have the beautiful sort of like fireworks type flowers on them. Um, I think it's because we have industry, agricultural industry here with onion and onion family plants that um, they could transfer, potentially transfer diseases to these states, which is why you can't get them. You can buy them locally. Um, so those are the decorative allium. Allium could also be the onion or chives or leeks or scallions or um, you know any of those things that you grow in your um, garden uh, that you eat. Um, so those are you can find them locally. I would just look locally for things. Uh, there are some. I don't know if the bulb companies. I haven't looked at them this year. The ones that are up in um, up in the Skagit 
they may have some allium that you can buy directly from them that are grown here. Um, but I think it, I think that has to do with agricultural issues with um, disease uh, potential. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I have one final question, but I would also love to invite everyone who's here to get one last question in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, but I'm curious if there's um, any considerations that need to be in place when you are removing invasive species from a steep slope. Um, you know, typically we want to stabilize slopes with native plants, but is there any recommendation you have about how quickly we remove those? Can we do it all at once and plant immediately? How do you go about doing that without losing your slope? Yeah, I think it depends on the slope. You need to kind of know what's happening with that slope, what the history of it is, has it slid? Um, how, how big is it, tall, you know, length, um, width of it. If it's a small slope along a stream bank, you could probably do it all at once and replant immediately. You want to make sure you mulch, though. You, you don't want to do this if you can't mulch the ground finally um, in that work day or two-day period. You don't want to leave it too long um, because the mulch will help to manage any rain that's falling on it. It will break it up a bit before it hits the soil. Um, you do want to plant it right away. You can put in, um, you can, if you're doing bare root, there's ways to put live staking in that will help to hold the hill. It's also um, a quick way for things to grow. Uh, it's essentially like putting cuttings into the hillside. You can also use things like compost socks or you can use burlap that you create sort of these compost um, tubes that you can put along the hillside so that you can um, manage uh, when water does hit it, that it's not all going to just go straight down the slope. It's going to hit this barrier and then slowly disperse rather than just come rushing down the slope. Um, so you, there's lots of techniques. There's some great um, information uh, through the uh, Washington Department of um, what's it, Natural Resources that had uh, about slope stabilization. I can try and find that and, and send that to you so you can share that. Um, you want to, but one of the things that's nice about this, this web link is that it has lists of plants and how they grow. So when you're talking about revegetating a, a slope, you want to make sure you're putting things in that aren't going to pull the slope down, but are going to actually help hold and knit it together. So the way the roots interact under the ground makes a big difference as to how stable that slope will be and how quickly. So getting fast growing things on it is important um, so you don't leave it. Um, vulnerable, but also getting that mulch on there is pretty top priority. A lot of times, you know, we get very invested, we get stuff out, we put things in, and then we're done. Uh, you have to finish that step because uh, otherwise you're, you're ruining the work you just did. All right. Um, well, I don't see any other questions. We covered so much tonight. So thank you so much, Laura. Um, I really appreciate you um, joining us to give this presentation and uh, teaching us. Thank you so Great. much. You're welcome. And thank you so much to everyone who joined us tonight. Um, I really, really appreciate you being here. Please don't be shy. Give me some feedback. Um, if there's anything that you liked or you know didn't like about uh, this webinar, I would love to hear it. it. We're always working to make things better. If you have suggestions for other topics, we'd love to hear it as well. Um, and if you'd like to consider the Soak It Up program and see if it'd be a good fit for you, please reach out to me. Um, and that's it. Thank you all. Hope to see you next week for our landscaping with native plants of the Pacific Northwest. Take care. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. You're welcome. Oh, I'm totally in the dark now. You're totally in the Ooh. dark. Yeah, that was a, a big switch. Um, That's funny. Yeah. That was great. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer from your pajamas. Yeah, where I'm headed. <laughs> so. I noticed a few typos as I was going through it since I, you know, I didn't give it um, as long a look over as I normally do. So let me, I'll fix it since it's just a link. It'll be fixed for you before okay. you share it.